Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm Washington Editor-at-Large of The Atlantic. This is one of my favorite events of the year. I feel like we, we are, we're failing you again. To, I forgot to get the mugs and t-shirts to give to those of you who make it through the entire day. But I tell you, it's worth it, and we've got great cocktails uh, at the end. We're now going to discuss, as, as Julian Castro and Matt Thompson were talking about housing and what's happened, one of the themes that we've wrestled through over the years is the question of how robust can U.S. economic growth be down the road if you don't get certain factors right? And we've been interested and had raised uh, various, at various points the financial crisis, the, the ongoing levels of debt that how many households continue to uh, carry with them. Uh, and there are just a lot of, of, of questions about it. So we're going to have Reviewing the American Dream, Private Sector Debt, and the U.S. Housing Market. And to do that, we've got three wonderful people. Uh, Stan Humphreys is Chief Economist of Zillow, the online real estate and rental database. Sarah rosen Wartell is President of the Urban Institute. Uh, and Susan Lund is a partner at McKinsey Global Institute. And she's author of a report that I, I really encourage people to take a look at suggesting that the, the U.S. economy has not deleveraged nearly as much as we kind of have convinced us, ourselves has. So it's a data-driven, very interesting report that, that, that refreshingly conflicts with an earlier McKinsey report that said the world was deleveraging. I just wanted to kind of get my check mark in there. Uh, uh, but uh, who, needs orth you know, who needs consistency? Uh, in any case, and moderating them, we have Nancy Cook, uh, who is here to lead the conversation, my colleague from National Journal. So please welcome them to the stage. So thanks everyone for joining us and thanks for um, coming. This is one of my favorite events of the year on Econ and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I just want to start off um, and hear from all of you. You know, Secretary Castro still thinks that housing is the way to go. It's the best way for Americans to build wealth. Um, that's been, you know, the argument I think for to continue to urge people to stay in the housing market. What do you all think? Do you, do you agree with his assessment? Susan, let's start with you. I agree that historically housing has been a way to build wealth, but over the last decade, what we've seen, it's been a complete disaster for millions of American households that bought homes um, during the bubble, during the early 2000s, uh, borrowed a lot against those homes, lost all their equity, and then some, and defaulted and had, were kicked out. Um, it's no news here that we've had a massive um, credit bubble, but it's very closely linked to housing prices and home ownership. So while I'm all for um, sustainable home ownership, I think the thing that we have to watch in the U.S. is to make sure that we're doing this in a sustainable way and don't repeat the devastatingly painful mistakes of the past. Okay, you, um, you just published an interesting book um, through Zillow talking a little bit about how uh, for low-income people buying in less affluent areas is, is still a real gamble. Can you talk a little bit about what you found with the data that you looked at? Sure, yeah, because typically when you talk about home ownership, of course, home ownership can and often is, is a great wealth creation uh, device, particularly because essentially it's a forced savings account where you're having to you know, put away you know, a chunk of change each month against what is typically a non-depreciating asset. Uh, the trouble is that a lot of those arguments are made on the average. So on the average, that's very true. And unfortunately, the returns to housing are not equal across the income distribution or across the price distribution. What we did in the, in the book was actually look at less affluent versus more affluent communities. And what you find was that the returns to housing over the 20-year period we analyzed, more affluent communities, more expensive communities saw about 60% higher returns and, surprisingly enough, less volatility. Uh, so that means that home prices are, are grow faster and have less volatility in more affluent areas, which means that in the less affluent areas you have a lot of volatility and not as high returns, um, which does, you know, again, it does kind of complicate that picture of thinking about housing as a, as, a, as a mechanism of wealth creation. And I guess we're particularly concerned about this at Zillow because the alternative in those communities oftentimes is rental housing. And in this, in this country right now we are seeing a real crisis in affordable rental housing such that we've never really seen it before. Um, you know, houses have, rental housing has never been less expensive than it is right now, and a lot of people think that's because of a cyclical issue right now. We've had a lot of homeowners thrown out of, for, out of their homes because of foreclosure, more demand than supply, and that's why rents are so high. It's actually a systemic issue that dates from the late 90s and early 2000s. So we are having trouble producing affordable rental housing in this country. Um, 
I want to come back to talk about uh, what are the right communities for people to be investing in or, um, or how we think about the importance of place. But um, I, let me just step back and say that I think, uh, uh, I completely agree with Susan that what we ought to be talking about is sustainable home ownership here. But um, we may n we're not at a place right now where we have a housing market that's operating in a normal way to generate uh, appropriate level of sustainable home ownership. My colleagues at Urban's Housing Finance uh, Policy Center have created an index they call the Credit Availability Index, and they've used it to measure how much risk the mortgage market is currently taking in comparison to other points in time. And it's able to do two very th interesting things. One is it can segregate, looking back historically, between the risk that came from the characteristics of products some of the really horrible things that we saw during the subprime market, and the risk that came from the characteristics of borrowers. And what we found was that during the bubble, we had enormous incremental risk from products, very much smaller additional risk from borrower characteristics, but not nearly as much. Today, there is virtually no risk in the market from those high-risk products, because they're almost all gone. Um, and we are taking less than half the borrower risk of default that we were at an earlier time. So if you compare that to say, not to 2007, which is an aberrant time, but 2001, 2002, we're taking less than half the borrower risk. Which means that, as Secretary Castro talked about, access to credit is quite limited for people who are seeking access. Whether home ownership is the right strategy for everyone, we don't have tax favored and um, other mechanisms as well designed for people to save. I completely agree that's an important question, but the market right now is far from normal. And what do you mean, and where would the rise of costs? Sorry, can everyone hear me now? Is that better? Okay. Sorry, we're having a little technical difficulty. Um, and so tell me what you mean, Susan and Sarah, you're talking about sustainable home ownership. Like, what does that mean? Unpack that for me. Well, what happened in the run-up to the bubble is you had very different housing markets across the United States. And when you look at the states like California, Nevada, Arizona, households in those states, their overall household debt relative to income was over 200%, 225%. Then you look at places like Texas, Kansas, didn't have housing bubbles, didn't have a big economic boom in the early 2000s. Household debt never reached more than about 100% of income there. So you had this enormous disparity. It turns out that the markets in Texas and Kansas were much more sustainable. You had far lower rates of foreclosure. Um, households reduced consumption less during the recession in those states compared to Nevada and California. So what we've got to do is get to a place where we have regulations um, that are consistent. As Sarah said, we've gotten rid of a lot of the infamous mortgages that created some of the problem. But at the same time, um, as a nation, we are a little bit schizophrenic on debt. We, on one hand, don't like debt. We believe in saving and living within your means, and yet we have a mortgage interest deduction. We give tax incentives for debt, which, by the way, go to the wealthiest households not lower and middle income households that generally don't itemize um, on their tax uh, deductions on their tax forms. Um, and, and even now, you know, Fannie Mae, for instance, not too long ago, increased the relative size of a loan against the value of a home for some first time home buyers to 97%. To put it in international comparison, um, in most countries in the world, the most you can borrow against the value of a home would be 80%, and that's consistent across the board. So to be sustainable, I think we need to be realistic about how much money households need to put down to get a mortgage and then stick to those limits. And is that, you think the same thing, Sarah? Is that what you're talking about when you're saying sustainable housing? Well, I'm not, certainly not talking about 20% down payments in this country. It's interesting, the level of c default risk that the mortgage market is currently taking, as I said before, is less than half of what it was before, and yet uh, the actual LTV levels haven't changed very much at origination. Um, our average LTVs are still relatively high compared to other um, markets, and part of the reason for that is because FHA has become a much bigger share of the marketplace, something that I think we'd uh, ult ultimately in the long best interest of the economy would like to see the private sector taking more and more of that risk. 
Um, so I'm not sure that I believe that LTV is always the most important uh, driver. As, we, as I said before, I think the characteristics of credit products is a big part of what got us in trouble. And borrower, I completely agree with Susan, the amount of debt that a borrower has is a hugely important thing. If you look at the amount of household debt for mortgages that we had versus um, uh, the debt that we had, the equity that people had in our homes, uh, those two factors, it always was the case that we had more equity in American houses than we had in debt. And then in about 2005, those two reversed, and we had more debt than we had equity in our houses. 2013, we, we actually restored the right order here now. And Americans, again, have about $11.9 million uh, trillion dollars worth of equity in their homes, and we have $9.8 uh, trillion dollars worth of debt. So the ratio is, is, has normalized there a great deal as far as household equity. Stan, based on your data, do you think that, in your book, do you feel like home ownership should still be this thing that's pushed by uh, the federal government as the best gamble for people? Well, I, I guess, I mean, as an economist, I mean, economists generally prefer uh, to have a, um, to not introduce distortions into a marketplace by favoring one type of ownership versus another. So, um, uh, but generally, so, so our perspective is that we want a, um, a variety of different housing options out there that, that fit the needs. And certainly, as I mentioned before, we're very concerned that increasingly we don't really have a system that's producing affordable rental housing options. So, and, and we do get a little bit concerned that, for example, in 2004 to 2008, there's no doubt that, that there was a hysteria around everyone should own. People stopped doing the napkin math around buy versus rent, how long am I going to be in the house, just basic practical decisions, and they always went out and bought a home. Um, even though they may not be there long enough to justify the, the purchase. So there became a hysteria around that, and we think that's not helpful, um, where it's good to be practical and do the napkin math and try to figure out whether it's better to buy or rent, because it really does, you know, there are times, and that's another thing we looked at in our book, there are plenty of times when, uh, when renting is a better option than buying. So just always saying that we want to push everyone we can into home ownership um, blindly is, is, is bad public policy, I think. What do you think would be a better way for the federal government or the private sector to help people build wealth, um, you know, apart from just this idea of building up home equity? Well, I do think that, you know, for example, when we think about the mortgage deduction, which is, you know, the third rail of real estate. So, you know, you, no one wants to talk about, um, you know, mortgage deduction, but the reality is that, uh, um, you, you know, as we just described, you know, it is a way, it does incentivize the debt accumulation um, in the housing sector as opposed to, you know, and if you look at it, it is utilized by not very many people. You know, as, as Mitt Romney famously reminded us, only half of people pay, pay federal income tax. Of those half that do pay federal income tax, uh, only a third itemize. And then of those, a lot of people rent or have paid off their home. So only 13% of Americans use the mortgage interest deduction, and 75% of that benefit goes to people over $200,000. So, you know, I, I generally I would argue that if you're going to spend $100 billion on, on housing, that's, that's fine. Um, let's spend $100 billion on housing. But we might want to look at a true market failure that exists in the housing market. And I think um, the, uh, the subsidizing debt accumulation is probably not the market failure. Or certainly subsidizing people's housing who are making more than $200,000 is probably not a market failure. I think we could probably agree on that. So maybe convert it into something like a first-time homebuyer tax credit. One time where you then, because that is a hurdle. You know, if you look at uh, communities of color, uh, that is the premier hurdle to getting into home ownership is, is the down payment and the closing cost. So maybe convert the $100 billion into actually solving that market failure um, instead. Sarah, did you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I, I completely agree on the regressivity of the home mortgage interest deduction. And it's, uh, uh, but I also want to just talk about a little bit more about the rental crisis that Stan started to describe. Um, we're facing a couple of really powerful demographic trends that are going to make this rental crisis even more profound. Um, we have population, the portions of the population that are growing in many of our cities are typically the populations that ha uh, achieve home ownership later in their life, um, especially minority families. Um, millennials are uh, moving into home ownership uh, later than others have. Um, and so you've got a lot of demand, and you've got uh, a lot of demand from high income people who are essentially taking the housing. If, for example, we looked in DC, that might otherwise, in, 
middle income people are taking the housing that might have even gone to the lower income families in sort of pass down because there's insufficient supply. So we're, we have a huge drive up in rent costs and in some places ironically sort of there's cheap suburban tract housing in the outer suburbs where there's less demand and value for that now. So we may actually be skewing some people to look at, we're going to see the inverse of suburbs becoming the places where the lower income f uh, families are driven and our cities are becoming the place where the privileged have the ability to live whether they rent or own condos and the like. So um, we've got that phenomenon happening and then we have the aging of our population and our housing stock is generally not in transit rich walkable areas with the kind of amenities that older families uh, and individuals need and we don't have financing mechanisms to adapt that to the physical frailties that older populations have. So we have two big trends they are going to put huge pressure on our rental housing stock and our supply system either at the low end or at the middle is not generating the kind of stock that we need. Yeah, that's good points. What about, um, you know, Secretary Castro was also talking about the wealth gap, just the gap between, um, you know, whites that own homes and African Americans. What can the federal government or the private sector, what can we do to tackle that? Susan, do you want to take this? Well, there are a lot of different policies to encourage different types of savings, and I agree completely with Stan that what you want as a household is a portfolio of different options. And one of the things that makes the U.S. unique is that, compared to other countries, when you look at household wealth, until you get to the 90th percentile of the income distribution, there is no net worth outside of people's homes. So it is not only the primary, it is really the only savings vehicle that a lot of people have. That's very skewed and it's risky, as we've seen, when house prices fall 30%. But I think that there are options on how to make this all more sustainable. Um, various economists have put forth ideas for innovations in mortgage contracts, for instance. Robert Schiller has urged a continuous workout mortgage um, in which when somebody became unemployed or the economy falls into a recession, the amount that a borrower has to repay each month is adjusted. And then in return for that, of course, there's some premium paid to the creditor for taking on that risk. Um, another book urges um, a shared responsibility mortgage. If your home price falls below the purchase price, um, again, you reduce the amount of repayment owed each month so that you can avoid home foreclosures and defaults, um, but then the lender gets some of the upside when home prices recover. So when you think about some of the innovations we had, we had tremendous innovation in mortgage contracts between about 2000 and 2007. A lot of it proved very unsustainable. Let's apply some of that same financial innovation to think about how could we make these contracts a little bit more flexible um, and enable people then to stay in their house and continue to build wealth instead of having to foreclose, default, and lose everything they've put into it. Also, clearly, we need savings vehicles that are outside of home ownership, and um, we, I think, our public policy doesn't have the resources in it, or at least the perceived resources in it today, to create the same kind of incentive to save. Um, one of the things that we've been interested in is: is there a way to sort of couple rental o rental housing? with some kind of incentive so that people were putting aside money as they were renting. Our experience is that people who rent generally have very, very low savings rates. And so the ability to save whether it's for ultimate home ownership or whether it's for some of the other things that people use assets for, sending their kids to college, smarting small businesses, um, uh, rental housing both because it's expensive um, and because of the lack of the nudge implicit in housing to save. Uh, doesn't create those opportunities. And, and unfortunately it is because how expensive it is, increasingly expensive, that it, it you know, obviously these typically the rent families that will rent will be less affluent than, than owning families, but uh, it is clear that over the past 20 years they're paying a much larger percentage of their incomes to rent than they ever have, and that is because of a failure to uh, create adequate su supply generally. Of course, income growth hasn't been great either, but if you look at the, the lines for income growth and the rent growth, the rent growth is really is markedly departing from the income growth line um, for a variety of reasons. And actually the sources of that are, are pretty nettlesome where they are, you know, you know, generally in the 80s and 90s we moved away from this 
philosophy of the public provision for affordable housing and, and said we want the private sector to do that. And generally, I think that was a very, that was a, that's a good idea. And we said we'll have the private sector provide affordable housing options and we will subsidize it through low-income low housing tax credit and Section 8 vouchers. Unfortunately, those two, you know, that constellation of policies we put in place just aren't getting the job done. And you know, I think at Zillow, we are spending a lot of time this year trying to dive into the, the, the roots of why it's not being provided because oftentimes the roots are, it's not necessarily that we need you know, more low-income housing tax credit. A lot of the roots of inability to supply affordable rental housing is these local regulations. It's zoning and uh, you know, regulation, it's uh, parking minimums, things like that that inadvertently drive up the fixed cost for every development. And you know, as a developer, given a higher fixed cost, you're going to try to put a higher margin unit on that property, which is what we're seeing. And there's no doubt that, that places like Houston don't have really an affordable housing crisis like San Francisco does. And Houston has no zoning laws whatsoever and very few building regulations. Now, you may not like to live in Houston, but you know, if you're less affluent, then Houston looks pretty attractive relative to the Bay Area. Yeah, that's great. I think we have time for one question. Um, there's people with mics in the audience. Any questions? There's one over here. Hi. Um, do you think there's a role for the uh, sharing economy in single-family homes uh, such that, I mean, that could avoid the high transactional costs associated with buying and selling and having all your money in one basket and giving more mobility? Well, there's no doubt that the sharing economy is already huge in real estate with, through things like Airbnb. Unfortunately, right now, you know, th that's an area that I think is, is ripe for some research where generally there's a little bit of concern that Airbnb is actually pulling inventory out of the medium-term rental inventory and putting it into the short-term rental inventory, which is creating exacerbating problems for people who, families who are trying to live in a place for a couple years, that unit is being taken off and being rented to someone who wants to stay somewhere for a week. Um, but generally, I think that sharing economies generally do squeeze efficiencies out of the marketplace. I mean, there's no question but that places like, you know, sites like Uber or Lyft and others are creating, taking slack capacity in a system and putting it to use. And I think that we can definitely do the same thing in housing. Especially with some of our big cities where we have so much of the housing is investor owned and very rarely occupied. But the other way to think about this relates to the problem I mentioned before of people having the ability to age in place. Um, uh, we've got a lot of people who are overhoused, meaning that they live in homes that were appropriate when they had a larger family and they want to age in place, but they have more square footage than they need, and you are, often that's in same markets where you have demand. Um, there are lots of complicated issues about the matching of people and security of older Americans with people living in their homes that s local groups are just beginning to try to think about. But that's another place where the sharing economy might be able to do something. Um, Stan talked about the need to bring down housing costs. Um, we always talk about bending the cost curve in healthcare, but I think in some ways it's really about bending the cost curve in the production of housing. And one way to bend the cost curve is to make the existing stock more productive, if you will, uh, in other words, allow more people to use the excess capacity in the stock. That's great. I, I think we have to wrap up, actually. But thank you so much to the panelists. I appreciate it.